and welcome to another edition of the International Sunday School Lesson. Today's lesson is entitled, Siblings Rivalry, and it's taken from Genesis, the 25th chapter, verses 19 through 34, and it's for November the 4th, 2018, fall quarter, lesson number 10. Now, a little background information, if you'll remember back from last weekend, where we were talking about how that Abraham had sent his servant uh, to get a wife for his uh, son Isaac, and his servant come bringing back Rebekah, and Rebekah and Isaac were married, and that was a comfort to Isaac, who was mourning the loss of his mother, who had just recently passed away. And that's where we take up our story this week. Uh, Genesis 25, 19 through 21. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padanaram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So we see here how that it's describing how that Rebekah uh, was brought to uh Isaac to become his wife, and they had been married for about 20 years, and they still didn't have any children, so um, they were praying, and Isaac was praying uh, for uh, the Lord to bless them with a child. And we see how that the Lord heard their prayers and did bless them and Rebekah became pregnant. And this was after 20 long years of waiting for the birth of a child. Okay? Now, 22 and 23, the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So we see that how that um, Rebecca is pregnant. And as those of us who have been married to somebody who's went through uh, pregnancy and someone who is, or maybe uh, women, if you're a woman and you have been pregnant, you know how that these children uh, will kick all through the later stages of pregnancy. And that's normal. But from what Rebecca was experience, experiencing, it seemed to be a little more out of the ordinary that all the kicking was going on. So, uh, she went and inquired of the Lord, and, and the Lord gave her a word of prophecy that, uh, that she wasn't just pregnant with one kid. She was doubly blessed. She had twins uh, in her womb. And these two twins will be at odds with each other for the most part and that one of them will be stronger than the other, and contrary to the way that usually works out, it is the younger who will be stronger and prevail over the older child. And that these two children are going to become great nations and last for generations and generations and generations. And we see that uh, historically, 
that is the case. Now, it is true that there are no Edomites uh, in the world today that we know of, but they are still Jews that are in the world today. They have lasted all of these thousands and thousands of years from this time, that time forward. Because this child, one of the brothers, the younger brother, is going to be the father of all the Jews in the world. And the older brother, Esau, is going to be the father of the Edomite nation, which lasted all the way up through uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. They were still Edomites at the time that Jesus was walking on the earth, thousands of years later. Okay? Now, 24 through 26, When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. And afterwards his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So we see here how that uh, she did have a birth. The oldest one, the firstborn that came forth was had a real red hue to him. And his body was real hairy. And we've all seen children that had a lot of fuzz on them. And that's pretty much all what this is talking about. It does not mean he had fur, but he was just a real fuzzy baby. And we've all seen babies like that. And that's the way Esau was. And his little brother, the younger, Jacob, when he come out, he was hanging on to Esau's heel. And that actually comes into play with how they named him Jacob. Because in the original Hebrew, that has a connotation about that heel holding that Jacob was doing. Okay, now continuing on, 27 through 28. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, I'm going to point out a couple of things here. First off, don't try to take your children and make cookie cutters out of them. They're not little ewes. They're not mirror images of their siblings. And we need to take and let children have their natural growth, their natural inclinations, and let them be their self for the most part. Now, do I, am I saying we should let children do anything they want to do? No, I'm not saying that. But let's take, for example, you may have one child who has a personality trait that could develop into persistence or it could develop into stubbornness. You don't need to take that quality out of that child because persistence and obstinance are really the same bent in people. It's just whether or not it's used for good or bad. What you do as a parent, what you should strive to do as a parent, is to get your child to use their natural inclinations for good purposes and to help them 
avoid using their natural inclinations for bad purposes. Because everybody has got their own inclinations, their own natural skills, their own natural strengths, their own natural weaknesses that they have built into them. And you can take any almost any quality that can be used for good, that same quality can be flipped over and used for evil. Just like I was talking about, persistence and stubbornness are really in the person in a per- somebody's personality is really pretty much all the same thing. It's just a question of how they how it's used. Is it used positively or is it used negatively? And the thing that again that you should not try to do is if you have a child whose natural inclination is a certain way and they like to study. Let's say you have a kid that loves to read. You shouldn't try to uh, make that kid not read. Get them to read the right kind of things, things that are going to do them some good. If you have a child that has got a very vivid imagination, there's two ways that can go. kid with a real vivid imagination can become one of the worst liars in the world and, would, and, and one of these kind of people that would rather uh, climb a tree to tell you a lie than stand there on, stand there on the ground and tell you the truth. And I've, I've seen people like that. I've had people I cared about who were that way. And they wouldn't tell malicious lies. They would just be lying just to be lying. And, you know, and, and, and what that can be sometimes is this bent up creativity that they naturally have and they've never found a productive, meaningful outlet for it. So if you got a kid that has got a real vivid imagination, let me encourage you to for you to encourage them to find a productive outlet for it. Cuz there're plenty of places that a kid could use their creativity in a very meaningful way. They could write music, they could write poems, they could write short stories, they could uh, invent things, they could do a host of things that someone with creativity can do throughout the course of their life. And if you channel that and allow that to uh, come forth and put it in a real productive way, uh, it's 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 great, but don't try to cookie cut, rubber stamp your children to where they are mirror images of each other. Let them be uh, the way they're naturally wired. Just help them, train them, push them, motivate them to use that wiring in a very productive way. Okay? Now, another thing, too, and we see this multiple places in the Bible. Multiple places in the Bible. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. We have multiple stories in the Bible where a parent will pick one child and love them more than the other children. 
they'll have their pet. And you can do more damage to your children doing that. Do not do... Mothers and fathers, please don't do that to your children. It causes damage on all of them. None of them escape the damage that that causes. We see that, for example, Rebecca had her pick. She had her pick out of Jacob. That did not work out well for Rebecca. Uh, we f see later on in the story, uh, later on um, in the book, in the Bible, how that Rebecca had worked out this deal to help Jacob uh, uh, help Jacob to con his daddy. And what ended up happening is she never saw her son again. It put a barrier because Jacob had to leave the country. He had to go. And Rebecca ended up never seeing Jacob after she uh, worked out that scheme and helped Jacob pull off that scheme to finish getting everything from Esau. Did not work out well for Rebecca. And if you do that and you play favorites with your kids, it will always backfire. Uh, we see in the story of King David how that, oh, he loved Absalom. He loved Absalom. He put up with stuff out of Absalom that he wouldn't have put up out of with none of his other kids. And Absalom nearly took the kingdom away from David. If it hadn't been for miracle, a miracle working God, Absalom would have killed his daddy and been sitting on the throne. And that happens if you if you spoil a child and you put one kid above the other, it is going to always come back and get you. So let me encourage you to be as even and fair-minded with your children and your grandchildren. If you're teaching school with your school children, try to be as even and as fair as you possibly can and do not pick pets because it will it will cause damage in them it causes damage in the kids around them the ones who are not the pets it damages the pets and it will a lot of times will come back and bite you and you'll it'll break your heart when it when it happens do not do what Isaac and Rebekah did with Esau and Jacob. Be fair, even-handed with all your children. Anyway, now that I've meddled, let's go on. Okay, Genesis 25, 22, 29 through 34. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. And Esau said, I am about to die. What use is a birthright to me? Now, explain a few, let me explain a couple of things, or explain one thing in particular, and that's this concept of birthright. Now, the birthright was the tradition that the eldest child uh, was to take over 
uh, pretty much all the family business, so they were given a double portion and to administer things. They also, too, uh, were given the responsibility of taking care of their parents in their old age. So that's the, one, another one of the logics why they, why they ended up getting, uh, getting a double portion was that they had the responsibility of taking care of their, their parents in their old age. So what, uh, uh, what had happened was Esau was out in the field. He come in. He wanted immediate gratification. He was a little bit hungry. And Jacob had done all that cooking. And so Esau wanted some of that food. And notice what he said. I am about to die of what use is a birthright to me. That immediate gratification, forgetting about the consequences of his actions. Now, Esau was not about ready to die. He was hungry, but he was not dying. And that birthright had very long-term consequences. Very long-term consequences. And oftentimes, we end up doing that kind of thing, and we end up not thinking about the future, not thinking about the consequences of our actions, only wanting immediate gratification. We might not be thinking about any kind of consequences about um, any kind of consequences about our not going to college, not saving for retirement, uh, not uh, paying our bills on time, not um, working as hard as we should work on a job. And we're not thinking about the consequences of our actions and come to find out their consequences. Now, there's a little bit of a tension in when we go to think about things. Uh, you have to... Um, you don't want to put all of your effort in saving and for a rainy day and not work for God. But on the other hand, you don't want to spend every penny you got coming in and not put a little back for your retirement. I, God doesn't want us to be foolish. He doesn't want us to be carnal and worshiping money. But He does not want us to be foolish. Anyway, okay, and then Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. And we see that being quoted several places in the scripture about how that Esau despised his birthright. And I I shudder to think of the situations that we see today in churches and in people's lives where we where people are obviously despising our birthright as the children of God and turning their back on the work of God, the blessings of being a Christian, the power of the Holy Ghost, the strength that's in the Word of God, and how that people are turning their back on that, despising their birthright because they want to live for that immediate gratification. They want that little buzz from that beer they go down to the market and buy. They want to... Uh, run around on their mate or watch that filthy movie or whatever and and not read their Bible and not pray like they should. And they want that immediate gratification. 
and they despise him their birthright. Okay? Now, concluding thoughts. Uh, treat everybody fairly. Treat your children fairly. Um, try to be the best parent that you can be. Um, pray. Believe God. Believe God uh, and don't despise your birthright. Don't sell out eternal good for that immediate gratification. Well, friends, I'll be with you next weekend.